I'm Whitney Tilson. I hope you enjoy this video. If you'd like to learn more about case learning and our programs, just go to caselearning.com. And if you have any questions, just email me at info at caselearning.com. First up, can you just introduce yourself a little bit and, and you know, uh, just tell people uh, a, a little about your fund and how long you've been in existence and, you know, just a little brief history of, of yourself. Um, and then we'll start talking about Tesla. Sure. Um, but first, let me say to your Romanian guy there that a very good friend of ours is Romanian and she just brought us uh, this Count Dracula uh, clock when she came back. And I can't actually figure out where to put it, but I love it. Um, so anyway, um, so my fund is that we're a deep value, uh, long short uh, investors, both sort of equity and macro. And most of the money I've made over the years, and, and I opened this fund in 2011. Before that, I was an investment banker uh, for a long time. And before that, I worked in commercial real estate. So Wall Street itself was a second, is a second career for me. I've, I've been on the street for 15 years now. Um, most of the money I've made has been in deep value, uh, long positions in micro cap stocks, which is a very inefficient market just because they're small companies and big funds can't play there. And, and I can, cause I, I have a small fund. However, uh, over the last year and a half or so, I've just been able to find almost no value in that market. I mean, just everything is expensive. So I've gotten increasingly shorter uh, to my detriment for now, but I, I think it will work out. And, and on, the, on the short side, I can basically go anywhere. And, and so I've, I'm short some macro ETFs. And, and of course, I'm somewhat, uh, at this point, notoriously uh, short Tesla for a while, which is you know, how we've all met here. So that, that's my background. Great. Um, can you um, just give us a little history? It doesn't sound like, you know, given the background you've given us, it does not sound like you would now be the world's most famous uh, short on Tesla, right? Uh, you, you didn't work in the automotive industry, uh, et cetera. So, you know, um, um, this is a seminar focused on deep dive on short selling. It's always sort of interesting you know, sort of the history. How did it first come on your radar screen? You know, when did you first short it? Um, and, and just give us a little history and then we can turn to, okay, you know, what's this situation uh, look like right now? How do you think it's gonna play out? What do you think the market's missing today? You know, that kind of thing. But start out, just give us, you know, a little history uh, uh, of your involvement with this particular stock and, and why Tesla? You know, we were just, uh, you may have picked up at the end, one of our students just presented Zillow, which, you know, given your background in commercial real estate, well, I was commercial real estate, not residential, but- I've looked at it. Know. I like Zillow. I, you know, one of the reasons I think Zillow is interesting, and I haven't done anything on it yet, is the CEO is a great admirer of Elon Musk. He said he's like, he thinks he's the greatest CEO. So that kind of put Zillow on my radar screen. <laughs> um, with with uh, Hussein's permission, um, by the way, uh, Hussein uh, is is joining us from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia today, uh, another wow. country uh, we've got covered here. Um, um, so with Hussein's permission, uh, I'm sure he'd be uh, uh, willing to, you know, email you his slides on Zillow and uh, since uh, if you're interested. Sure. Yeah, I'd love to see it. Um, so to the point on Tesla, so I've always been a car guy, um, you know, since I, as, as long as I can remember. And I hadn't really paid too much attention to Tesla. And then it kind of came on my radar screen when it made that massive move from like the 30s to the 90s in 2013. And Whitney's smiling because he knows that move. <laughs> He's been where it I am. It wasn't the 90, man. It, wasn't, it went from 35 to 205 right. on a rope. And I was it the entire time. Right. So, you know, so I got interested in, in, I guess, you know, part of the way through that move in the 90s. And I just looked at it. I looked at the market cap then relative, you know, to where I thought it could ever make enough money to justify that market cap. And, and I put on a tiny position and I, I run a very concentrated fund. I mean, you know, it's, it's it, on, on, certainly on a macro position, I'll, I'll put a third of the fund long or short an ETF and on an individual stock, you know, I'll typically run 25% of the fund if I have incredible conviction, and sometimes as much as a third. And and How so, but your fund, by the way, Mark. What's that? 
How big is your fund? Yeah, we, I mean, we're tiny. We're eight million dollars. So and gotcha. you know, so um, and by the way, my my intent is to cap this thing at fifty, no matter uh -huh. what, because I've I've really made all the money on the on sort of the micro cap, nano cap side of things, and I can't scale that beyond fifty. And so that's sort of, but that that's we're not there, obviously. So anyway. Uh, back to this point. So I, ha I put on a tiny position, literally like a 1% position or something like that uh, on Tesla in the 90s. And, and then as, it, as I learned more and more about the company and the stock price got higher and higher, I got huge in this thing in, in roughly the 250s. And, and I've stayed huge. And, and that's been like four years or however long that's been. And you know, it, the, the problem that, you know, it, if you look at the stock now, I mean, it's it's 298. It hasn't moved much in, in four years, certainly not relative to the NASDAQ or any of the other wild stocks. But I just got, you know, I got, I, I'm down substantially on a position because they got whipsawed so much. And, you know, that's it could be an unavoidable thing in short selling. I mean, you know, you put on a position at 250, it goes to 350. You have to take stock off on the way up. Then it comes down. Then you put the position back up to whatever percentage of AUM you want that position to be. Then it goes back up. You got to take it off. And it's the whipsawing. It's basically, you know, covering on the way up and then putting it back on that can really kill you. So if we had just put this position on, you know, at 250 and let it be way, way bigger than I wanted it to be as a percentage of AUM, it would have come back and, and we wouldn't have lost much. But obviously you can't do that because, you know, if you have a bubble stock, and this is, you know, an important lesson. And I guess the best example in history is, is probably Tilray. And it's very recent history, obviously. You know, you, you can reach a, a point where, and I think David Einhorn says this too, actually. You, you can reach a point where, you know, 100 is the same as 200, is the same as 300, is the same as 500 a share, because it doesn't matter anymore. And that's, that's always your fear when you're short a bubble stock. But you know, Whitney had asked me, you know, why Tesla and how I got involved. Well, as I said, I originally got involved because I was intrigued by the by the car side of it. But really, Tesla checks every single box you'd ever look for uh, for a short position. You know, incredibly promotional, lying CEO, you know, terrible business model, huge encroaching competition, no real, you know, fundamental substantial work on on the long side and you know so to whitney's point well i'm not in the auto industry well first of all not not that this is exactly an answer to that but if you look at the biggest sell side bulls on the stock none of them come from the auto sector i mean i guess you could say jo adam jonas does come from the auto sector but he's not even the biggest bull anymore but it's basically tech analysts that Tesla has wanted to cover its company because it, it's wanted to sell this story that it's a tech company. Well, I mean, I defy any of you guys to show me a, a tech company with you know, gross margins in the teens and double digit negative operating margins. That's not a tech company, right? So, so at any rate, it's not a hard business to understand. It, it's, I, I, mean, I mean, look at it this way. One of the great selling points yeah. Uh, among Tesla bulls has always been that, you know, electric cars are incredibly simple. They have so much, so many fewer moving parts and everybody will want one. Well, you know, if they're incredibly simple, then an OEM, which makes incredibly complicated cars, obviously could figure out how to make incredibly simple cars. And they have, I, I mean, this week, Audi introduced a fantastic car, which, you know, which is which is this e-tron, which is an SUV crossover, which is going to sell for eight thousand dollars less than the least expensive, you know, Tesla Model X. The Mercedes EQC, which is a smaller electric crossover, which introduced was introduced two weeks ago, that's going to sell for around eighteen thousand dollars less than the cheapest Model X. Of course, Porsche is coming out with this Taycan next year, which will be fantastic. And, and Jaguar, the I-Pace is already in showrooms. I mean, I drove one a few weeks ago, and I know uh, Whitney's partner, Glenn, drove one. And, and it's a fantastic car. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's and, and any head-to-head -head comparison against Tesla, every reviewer said, you know, this is like a league above Tesla. So, the, the, uh, you know, I think what's keeping this company, the stock afloat now, is, is still the... the um, 
uh, I don't know, remaining belief, there's a better word than that, that it's somehow, you know, ahead of everybody in electric cars and dominant. And in fact, as these other cars arrive in showrooms, people are going to see that, that Tesla is now trailing edge. T Tesla is, I don't know if you guys are old enough, but Tesla is a Palm Pilot, you know, when BlackBerry came out, or it's a BlackBerry, you know, when the iPhone and the Android phones came out. And, and that's what's going to happen. They'll see these cars in showrooms. In, in fact, I, I sort of restructured my position. I mean, I was short, just outright short a lot of stock. Now we're outright short some stock, but I've basically rolled into long-term leaps. I started with the January 2020s, but literally yesterday I moved them to the June 2021s because my backup case here, I mean, if you all know that there's some chance Tesla could go bankrupt in the next three months. I mean, they've got a DOJ investigation going on, these SEC investigations, be very difficult for them to raise money and they need money. But if somebody throws them a lifeline uh, to keep the lights on for a little while, my sort of backup scenario here is this just becomes a busted growth story when people realize that there are so many other alternatives out there. and and. And, and so then Tesla just sort of, um, um, what's the word, you know, com comes down to, there's a word um, that people use, but basically the valuation comes down to what it should be. The bubble, the air goes out of the bubble and, you know, it becomes a, a, a money losing or, you know, best case breaking even, you know, car maker selling at one time's revenue, like all the rest of the car makers. So that's why I want to have those leaps because these other cars will, will be in the showrooms between now and, and next year. And, and, you know, by the middle of 2020, everybody's going to see what's going on. Um, thank you, Mark. Um, can you just talk a little bit about sort of how you've manifested the position and any lessons learned? Um, you talked about sort of being whipsawed and, um, you know, in hindsight, you just sort of wish you'd, I don't know, put on a 5%, you know, a good size, just common stock short position. It's not paying a dividend. Uh, so you don't have to pay that. And then, you know, you just sort of held it. Um, uh, and, and you know, obviously hindsight's always 2020, but these are young folks who don't have a lot of, uh, you know, some of whom don't short at all, but they want to learn the tools. And, and if they ever do it, want to learn from the scars you and I have on our, um, uh, talk about how you, how you size, how you use common stock versus options, uh, that kind of thing. So, uh, uh, Jim Chanos, who is who is a far better short seller than I'll ever be, or maybe than anybody will ever be, um, for, because there aren't that many of us left alive anymore. <laughs> anyway, but but you know, Jim says he'll never put on more than a five percent position in his fund, and you know that's how you that's one way you stay in business for thirty years or however long he's been around. You know, on the other side of the coin you know, the, the greatest short of all time, you're, it's still not going to make a big impact on your fund if, if that's the way you do it. So, you know, there's a trade-off there. I mean, part of it is how confident you are, how patient you are, how patient your LPs are. I mean, my LPs, even though I have a small fund, you know, I have, I don't know, close to 20 LPs, over 15. And a lot of them are hedge fund guys themselves who understand exactly what I'm doing. I mean, you know, guys who would, each put in two hundred fifty thousand dollars into my fund, or four hundred thousand, or five hundred thousand, and you know I've kept these guys appraised. You know, even beyond the letter. You know, like the night he put that tweet out, I sent out a, a letter that night, which Whitney saw to keep everybody in the loop about what was going on. And and basically all the feedback I I got was, Mark, we'll only leave your fund if you cover this short position. <laughs> so. I mean, these guys all know what's going on. They're, they're almost all pros. The ones who aren't are, are friends and family who aren't going anywhere. Um, so, you know, that, that helps a lot. And, and the fact that, I mean, look, I run this from a home office. I outsource accounting. I outsource audit. I outsource legal. I outsource administration. And so my, my expense, you know, my expenses are low. So it, it takes a lot of the pressure you know, off of me and allows me to keep a position for a long time. And by the way, that goes for long positions too. I mean, you know, I don't know. I, I mean, very honestly, I don't know that we've, I'd have to double check. I don't know that we've ever lost money on a long position because I just buy them so cheaply. And these were all micro caps and you, they've definitely gone down on us. I mean, I've had, I've had micro cap longs that went down 50% before they went up two or 300%. 
But, you know, I, I can stick with these things for a long time because I'm very patient and I have patient LPs. So to, so to answer your question, look, I mean, it's a risk reward scenario. If, if you always cap a short position to no more than 5% of AUM, as Jim does, you know, that really caps your risk. You'll stay in business a long time. But if you see something like Tesla, which to me, as I said, it checks every box, you know, I've gone a lot bigger on it. It's hurt me. So in hindsight, look, yeah, I mean, in hindsight, um, I would have been long at 35. Uh, I would have uh, sold the position at, uh, at 380 when Musk puts the tweet out. <laughs> and then I would have put half the fund short the position at exactly 380. <laughs> but, you know, but, but short of that kind of hindsight, I don't know what I would have done differently. I mean, here's the problem. There, there's a couple of problems. One is, and by the way, um, I've met a lot of great people by having such a large mouth <laughs> about being short this thing. Whitney among them, and Whitney's introduced me to some great people, and a lot of people come to me. And here's, here are a few observations people have made to me. And the most common one, and I probably hear this at least two or three times a day, and sometimes more often, from guys many of whom you've heard of, you know, many of whom are famous or semi-famous investors, and, and, a lot, and they're all short Tesla, and universally they say to me, Mark, you know, I've been in this business for 30 years. I've been in this business for 40 years. I've been in this business for 45 years. I've never seen a stock like this. I've never seen a greater disconnect from reality in a, in a mega cap stock as, as I see in Tesla. So I, I don't know exactly what lessons we can, we can draw from it because this is a stock that, that has so many landmines, as I've written in my letter, that you know, literally any day you could wake up and, and it would be down $100, right? And on the other side of the coin, here's a stock that, that the other day it came out that there's a DOJ <laughs> investigation going on. It, it quickly dropped, I don't know, $20, came, came back to only being down $10, and now you know, the stock is, is $297. It's significantly higher. I mean, you know, earlier in the month, it came out that the second uh, chief accounting officer this year had quit on basically no notice, right? So the stock immediately dropped into the 250s, and, and now it's 297. So it, it's a complete anomaly. I, I look, I guess the, the answer is if you want to stay in business and and you and and too much risk bothers you, and too much risk should bother anybody in this business. Then, yeah, I mean, cap a short position at, at no more than five or maybe ten percent of your fund, and you know, do what what I think Jim does. He once explained to me is, you know, if, if it's a if it's a five percent position and and you know, it, it goes up ten percent that night, then take a little bit off, and and if it goes down, put a little bit back on, and at least at least the whipsawing will be small. The whipsawing, you know, won't be huge. So there are no easy answers on short selling, you know, and. And actually, there's a great profile of him, an institutional investor. It's free online. You guys should all read it. It just came out this week. And he's racked up great returns. And the way he's done it is by being leveraged long uh, index funds and then, you know, concentrating his, his uh, individual positions on the short side, whereas he, I think he phrased it, that's where he, you know, spends his, his intellectual capital. And it, it's worked out really well. It, it's given him... It gives him, and by the way, there was a fantastic investor uh, named Robert Wilson. Whitney, do you know who he was? So Robert Wilson, he, he actually died a couple of years ago. One of the most fantastic interviews I've ever seen with any investor ever is a two-part interview. You guys should take notes of this and, and check it out. A two-part interview with Robert Wilson on the street.com that was done in, in 2000. Just before the just before the tech bubble uh, popped, and Wilson's Wilson's sort of um, infamy was he was the guy who was short Resorts International, which you guys are too young to know, but Whitney will know, was this high flying Atlantic City casino stock um, that I don't know he shorted like in the single digits and it went into the high double digits, and this was before the internet and you know all they had were fax machines, and he went on a world tour with this short position and he'd arrive at each new city and he'd have to meet another margin call and 
And, you know, it just killed him. But what Wilson said was, and by the way, he's, I think he said he was still up that year despite that, but this was a famous thing. Anyway, what Wilson said was having short positions gave him the confidence to get aggressively long because he figured that, you know, if, if, if his growth aggressive longs, if, if the market sort of popped or crashed, that his short positions, those companies were so much worse that he would be well protected. And that's a little bit, I guess, of the philosophy of, of Chanos' fund. He's, he's aggressively long the index funds and, and he has these short positions. So I think my best advice to anybody, and, and I follow this advice myself, is you know, don't, don't be short only. Use shorts to, to be able to maybe get more aggressive on, on really good long positions because it'll give you the confidence to do it that you know, if the whole market crashes, it won't take you out because you'll be protected that way. Uh, Dimitri, why don't you go ahead? I see you have your hand up. Um, uh, unmute yourself and um, introduce yourself briefly and uh, ask your question. Yes. Hello, Mark. Um, Hi, Dimitri. Can you, hear, can you hear me well? Perfectly. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Well, originally from Russia, St. Petersburg, then lived in Finland for 14 years, then France, and now moved to Romania. So originally not Romanian. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, petrol head, self-proclaimed. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, as am I. Yeah. And uh, love cars since very, very young age. And uh, concerning Tesla, I was talking about it a lot with um, Horace Dediu. I don't know if you know from Asimco. I'm sorry, with who? Horace Dediu from Asimco. On, he's quite active on Twitter as well. Um, what is his handle on Twitter? Uh, Asimco. A-S-Y-M-C-O. You know, I may have seen him, but I, I don't know him. So. so we were talking about, he's, he's also, he has a podcast about cars as well and oh. um, um, we're talking like the fact that you know Chinese need to access US and they're right now leapfrogging everybody in the EV development you know in next five ten years a lot of EVs will be coming from China and then we have a problem of the market access for them to the European and especially US market you just can't enter so for them Tesla would be an amazing purchase in case the company is going down one way or another. So what, what do you consider the, as a chance of a bankruptcy of Tesla from that perspective? I mean, there's a very deep pockets and government program from China to actually develop EVs. Right, well, okay, so there's a few things to sort of unpack in that question. Number one, what does Tesla have that's proprietary that other people- uh, Oh, no, it's, it's about brand and perception. So, okay, so th the second thing you have to look at is, and you look at this in any time you're short something actually, and, and you're wondering, hey, could somebody buy this? You know, look at the build versus buy scenario. What would it cost to build an electric car company from the ground up versus what would, what would it cost to, to buy Tesla? By the way, what I'm talking about here is maybe to make sure we're on the same page, I'm talking about Tesla now, not Tesla buying it out of bankruptcy for a tiny fraction. I mean, wh which are you asking me about? The Tesla on a way down, not bankruptcy, because well, I, I so feel like on, it won't reach the bankruptcy. Okay, so on the way down, Tesla has uh, over $10 billion of debt, okay? Mm -hmm. And it's got, um, beyond that, like $20 billion of long-term purchase commitments, mostly to Panasonic for batteries. But Let's just put that aside. Let's just say it's got over 10 billion of debt. You know, here's how I would look at this. And this is, by the way, how the world is looking at it. And this is apparently how Saudi Arabia is now looking at it and just putting that money into Lucid. You could probably develop a state-of-the-art electric car by hiring, you know, 2,000 engineers and paying them for three years, you know, for, I don't know, uh, $2 billion. And then you can build a brand new state-of-the-art electric car factory for, you know, two or three billion, call it $3 billion more. So let's say for $5 billion with no existing liabilities whatsoever, you could replicate everything about Tesla and actually be better because you don't have the liabilities and you don't have, you know, you probably have smaller ongoing losses um, versus paying even 
even buying Tesla for the debt of $10 billion or whatever, and then you have all those liabilities with it, much less some equity value on top of that. So I guess my answer is, look, there's a lot of stupid money in the world, especially in the world today, because no, so much it, has been printed. Exactly. So I, I guess the question is, you know, where would the stupid money say, yeah, I know I could do it for, for $5 billion, but I don't want to wait three or four years, so I'll just go ahead and do it. I mean, I don't know. I mean, $20 billion? Let's say it was $20 billion. So there's 10 of debt. So that leaves 10 billion for the equity. And the fully diluted share count is about 180 million. So, I mean, which, could somebody possibly come in at, at 50 some odd dollars a share on the way down and, and buy it? Yeah. I mean, it's, I can't say that's impossible. I, I don't think it's likely, but it's not impossible. So, I mean, I guess my advice is, you know, I wouldn't get short this thing at $50 being sure it's going to zero. But right now it's, you know, $298 and which is on any build versus, I mean, the funniest thing ever was when these, you know, dopey test lemmings are saying, oh, Apple should buy Tesla. No. Oh. <laughs> right? I, mean, I mean, does Apple, does the Apple brand, you know, need the Tesla <laughs> brand, number one? And, and, oh, by the way, you know, this is not exactly on topic, but it goes back to, to what Whitney asked me a, a few minutes ago. The thing, I, the thing I really did learn here in this whole experience is how proprietary, in a way, it's not exactly proprietary, but sort of, it, 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 how proprietary it is to learn how to mass manufacture cars mm. at high yes. quality and at reasonable profit margins. I mean, frankly, I would have made the same mistake that Musk made in thinking, oh, that's the easy part. No, apparently that is the super hard part. So, you know, that's but, the thing. But, but the problem with him was he was cutting corners. I mean, years of development were just cut without any consideration. Well, that's not even a manufacturing issue. That's a testing issue. Like, you know, any well, other- suppliers, order. you know, the control arm issues right now with the casting parts. I mean, that's ridiculous. Well, so that's a controversial subject with apparently seemingly collapsed Tesla suspensions. Um, yeah. But so far, the NHTSA hasn't done anything. It'll be interesting to see if they do. So, but anyway, um, so to your point, you know, somebody somebody could buy the company. It's not impossible, but it would be at a much much lower price than today. So, yeah, I'd make less on my short position than than I think I should make. Let me put it that way. But how? What do you think is going to happen? Like your prediction, personally. Do you think it's going to go all the way to bankruptcy? Okay, or? So, so first of all, you're asking a guy who's had the worst timing in history on, on any position of anything ever. Because as I said, I started shorting this, you know, a tiny position five years ago, but I got really big four years ago or, you know, four and a half years ago. So um, look, so here's the thing. I think that I think that bankruptcy is a real possibility. I think that for multiple reasons. Number one, in order to... Um, in order for Tesla to repair its balance sheet and have the CapEx necessary to become a viable company, in other words, to develop the Model Y and a pickup truck or whatever other nonsense oh. Musk is talking about, <laughs> somebody would have to put at least $5 billion into this company right now. And they'd be doing it, if they did it at a current you know, $60 billion enterprise value, there isn't enough stupid money in the world to, you know, to only get, you know, whatever that is, you know, one twelfth of the company for its $5 billion. So, you know, um, this could be one of those situations where it's 5 billion or nothing because nobody wants to put in a billion or two just to patch the balance sheet and then be in the same place in, in four or five months. And, and, you know, with these, with these SEC, so here's the thing. So normally I would say, and by the way, in my investment banking days, you know, I, I was a sell side banker and we used to do deals for companies. And normally if you have a stock at, at you know, $298 that trades seven, 8 million shares a day, you know, you could easily raise a couple of billion bucks just by doing an ugly deal with a bunch of hedge funds or an ugly convert deal where, you know, you sell them stock at a 15% discount and they just blow it out the next day. And Tesla has its money and, and the lights are on for six months. The problem with that is, that has to be registered stock. And Tesla mm -hmm. has this SEC and DOJ investigation going on. I've talked to multiple securities lawyers, and then there's also been Twitter talk about it. 
that there's no way they can get an SEC yeah. registration statement through now unless they just maybe they could do it if they disclose a lot of really ugly things. And, and I suspect I suspect there could be some real fraudulent stuff going on inside this company. And, you know, we don't have time to go into it today, but but at any rate, and, and they would have to disclose investigations into that. And then maybe they could get a registration statement through and then that would collapse the stock in itself. So, I mean, the answer to your question is they could go bankrupt because they can't get a registration statement through in order to put a relatively small, ugly deal into the market, which we keep the lights on for a while. But that said, look, I, I mean, there is a lot of, I mean, I guess I, I fully realized how much stupid money there is in this market <laughs> a few years ago when, when Facebook paid $20 billion dollars. Uh, for WhatApp, and WhatApp had zero revenue. And, you know, and when I saw that, I was like, okay, this resets the bar. And by the way, that's one of the reasons I didn't short Zillow. I don't remember what it is anymore, but I don't know, the market cap was four or five billion. I'm making up a number. I haven't looked at it in a while. So now all, my bar for shorting a stock is almost that it has to have a, an enterprise value of over 20 billion, or I'm afraid some idiot might just buy it, <laughs> you know? And uh, if you, you don't mind the follow-up question, have you tried to do like some of the parts in terms of the um, kind of like asset value of um, supercharger network, like brand? Like what do you think if somebody yeah, so, was come and so buy the, the parts? So you know, the supercharger what? network cost Tesla, you know, in the hundreds of millions of dollars, not in really? the millions. I forget what the number is anymore. I don't know, call it five, 600 million. I mean, there are much larger, faster networks being built right now as we speak. In the yeah. U.S., it's, it's, um, it's um, Electrify America, which is funded with over $2 billion from the Volkswagen settlement. In Europe, where you are, it's Ionity. <laughs> ironic. And, and, and the gas station, right, ironic. And the gas stations themselves, Shell is putting in chargers and stuff. Plus, you know, at least in the U.S., for instance, every Porsche dealer is going to have a 350 kilowatt charger. That's, there's 189 Porsche dealers in the U.S. I assume and I believe that every Audi dealer will have a charger, and that's 100. So, you know, each dealership network alone is very close to the size of the whole U.S. Uh, supercharger network, and probably in Europe, too, the size of the Tesla supercharger network. So it's going to be swamped. You know, I don't think it's got any value. Plus, you'd have to change all the, uh, you know, all the, all the, the connectors and everything to make them work on, on other cars because it's, it's its own proprietary standard, the superchargers. You know, the Fremont factory, that's a very high cost place to manufacture, especially if it becomes unionized there. I don't mm. know. I mean, you know, and by the way, this stuff is all has liens against it. The factory has liens against it. P pretty much any hard asset Tesla has is borrowed against. So, okay. you know, if you, so what, what's in your, some of the parts, I guess the brand, but that brand is becoming increasingly tarnished, you know, right now. So, but yeah, the brand would have some value. Somebody would pay, I don't know, a billion or two for the brand or maybe 3 billion for the brand. I don't know, but you know, but there's 10 billion of debt, most of which is secured. So I just, I can't, other than really stupid money, I can't come up with a valuation for the equity here that puts it, you know, anything above zero or, you know, single digits or, you know, pick a number. But again, that's not to say something stupid can't happen. Uh, how much, have you tried to estimate how much, for example, Audi spend on R&D for the e-tron or the well, Jaguar? They, they talked about it, actually. I, I, think, I think Audi's number for that car, and then there's another car they're making on the same platform, a crossover, which comes out next year. I think they said that they spent either a billion on it or maybe two billion. I mean, that's my point. You could develop. Wait, but BMW spent like 15 billion in the past few years on well, EV but, alone. Well, well but, but that's, to, that's to electrify a whole line of cars. And, and by the way, that's, well, that's not, a platform you need to build. I mean, you what's can't that? Just, yeah, it's, that's a platform you need to build. I mean, at the end of the day. Correct, but Tesla doesn't have that platform. The Model 3 is on a different platform you know, from the S and X. And I'm not even sure. I don't know that the S and X are on the same. I think they're on different. Platforms. They're, they're underpinning the, what I read, at least they're the same. Oh, on the S and X? Yeah. Okay. Well, definitely not on the three. So, no, no, it's a completely different one. Right. Yeah. So, you know, and, and 
So, I mean, the, look, I mean, the, I think the rule of thumb is you can develop a single new car model for about a billion dollars. I mean, that's what I've heard in multiple places. So, you know, when BMW talks about that, they're building battery factories, you know, they're, they're, I'm sure there's some, some, some combustion engine R&D in that number also. Um, so, I mean, you know, look at, look at Lucid. I mean, what Lucid spent to get its car to develop it's a billion dollars for a car i mean that's what i've heard you know maybe two billion something like that. so that's conventional right. ones yeah that's one billion to develop a new one that's okay. what i've read at least yeah, yeah yeah right so we're on the same page so i mean that's what i'm saying so why would you pay 60 for tesla and you have these massive liabilities you know you talk about the superchargers other than in bankruptcy that's a huge liability they've promised hundreds of thousands of people free supercharging yeah. for life <laughs> I mean, I mean, in Europe, electricity can be pretty damn expensive, you know, and in the U.S., it can be, a, I mean, in California, it's 26 cents a kilowatt hour on those things. I just saw a readout on it. You know, so, it, so it's, that's a, the supercharging network is a major liability unless it's in bankruptcy and you take away the free lifetime supercharging. It's not an asset for a buyer. That's, I guess that's what I'm saying. Okay. And um, last, very last comment. There will be a very interesting tour happening. I don't know if you heard about it. They're going to visit like some veterans of the automotive industry. We we'll visit nine different factories around the world. I, I know. I, I know about it well. I wish I had the time oh, to do I it. Wish because, too. <laughs> I follow, those guys I follow on Twitter, Bertle yeah. and, uh, yeah. and and same and, with me. And Ed, Ed, yeah, they're great guys. I know it's fascinating. And by the way, one more thing I'll say about that. It's amazing how many sell side tech analysts who have never set foot in a car factory in their lives, go into the Tesla factory and talk about how amazing it is. And oh, it's Tesla bloggers factory, now. <laughs> Tesla, what's that? The bloggers go there now, you know? <laughs> the Tesla factory has the lowest productivity of any, and the worst quality of pretty much any car factory in the world. And these guys go in there, and some of them, I won't name names, but one of them runs mutual funds with billions of dollars in them and has pumped the stock of CNBC <laughs> before, although not lately. Yeah, know, exactly. and, and, and this unnamed person talks about visiting the factory every quarter and says how amazing everything is. I mean, all these guys have to do is go to YouTube and just Google on YouTube or search on YouTube for BMW factory, Toyota factory, Honda factory. They'll see all the robots they've ever dreamed of seeing and they'll see factories that just run much, much, much better. If you talk to an experienced guy who's been in the Tesla factory, he will tell you how poorly run it is because he'll tell you people are running all over the place and <laughs> forklifts are going all over. And by the way, you see this in the injury rates that are reported. And, and they say in a, in a real modern efficient car factory, you almost see no human movement. It's like, it's just total calmness as, as mm -hmm. things go on there. So. It's but Mark, but Mark, BMW doesn't have a tent. <laughs> so um, let, let me see, let me see how I can tell you guys this story uh, without giving anything away. A, a reporter for a major uh, media publication wrote a fairly uh, positive profile of Tesla's factory a couple of months ago. It was very very high prominence in this publication. And the whole time he was there, they never told him there was a tent in the backyard building cars. They literally, they took him through the factory, they're showing him this and that, and they never told him about the tent. And when he found out about that afterwards, he, he suddenly realized what he was dealing with here. <laughs> I, you know, over a couple of beers, I could tell you more, but it's, it's how this company operates. Basically this company, burns every possible bridge. And listen, it, it comes from the top. I mean, you know, Elon Musk is a pathological liar, and that's easily documented, and, and a sociopath. And, you know, I mean, he puts these, he puts this beta version of autopilot out on the road. These are 5,000 pound cars driving into construction barriers. He makes up complete bullshit statistics to claim that these cars are safer, when in fact, they're not, if you look at them against peer groups, which are, you know, five-year-old or less modern luxury cars. I mean, you know, he'll say, oh, we're the, you know, we're very safe compared to overall cars. That's including like 30-year-old Travants in, in Romania. Or, you know, I mean, I mean, the guy, here's the thing about Musk, and I've said this before, you know, Musk is clearly a bright guy. You know, he's probably got 
10 IQ points on me, okay? I mean, Stephen Hawking probably had 50 IQ points on me. I'd say Musk has 10 on me, okay? But Musk thinks that you have to have whatever his IQ is, an IQ of 145 uh, in, order to under, in order to see through his bullshit. When in fact, if you have an IQ of 105 and just some common sense, you could see through his bullshit. That's the mistake he makes. He thinks he's, and it's sort of the mistake that sociopaths make. He thinks he's smarter and more clever than everybody else and nobody can see what he's doing. And all you have to do is look and you can see what he's doing. And also talking about accidents and repair damages. I mean, Teslas are notoriously expensive to repair. So Teslas, the insurance rates on Tesla are through the roof now worldwide. Um, and, and yeah, they're very expensive to repair. The parts are impossible to get, you know. Yeah. It, oh, amazing. yeah. Have you seen the videos from Norway? The pile, oh, yeah. piles of... No, you like, know, that, I mean, that said, I'm surprised. I mean, sales in Norway still for Tesla are up this year. I mean, it's, it's a, str but then again, just in Norway, the new Audi e-tron, uh, somebody told me the other day, I put it on Twitter, got 5,500 reservations, which is huge for the size of that market. So yeah. this goes, look, you know, I, I have a very, very smart girlfriend. We've been together forever, but she knows nothing about finance. Uh, she's a doctor, but, she, and so she's smart. And she said to me two years ago, she said, you're banging your head against the wall until people see these other better cars in the showrooms. And you know what? It's turning out that, she, that that was great common sense. And she's probably right because nobody who drives an e-tron uh, an e or an I-Pace is going to buy a Tesla. I mean, you know, maybe one out of 10. I mean, so, you know, that's why it's happening. So it's just, it takes some patience. And in the meantime, there's all these landmines out there. I mean, this DOJ thing, the SEC thing, must drug habit. I mean, there's all kinds of crazy stuff going on out there. That's why it's like, it's like, in, so back to Whitney's question, the hindsight question, I don't know. I mean, what do you do about a company that could blow up at any time? I mean, a, a lot of guys have said to me, you know, Mark, I see everything you see, but what's the catalyst? What's the catalyst? If I said to these guys, well, the catalyst is the announcement of a DOJ investigation, They'd be like, yeah, that's it. I'm going to put a quarter of my fund short then. Well, guess what? The stock is, you know, whatever, 20 points higher now, you know? So, I mean, I don't know what the catalyst is anymore. I just know that, that something is going to blow this crazy thing up, and I want to be there when it happens. And if you, and if you want to be there when it happens, you can have some pain on the way. I think, one of, Mark, one of the really interesting things is the acceleration of uh, executive departures. Hmm. So, I mean, Chanos has said, yeah. you know, he had said the only time he saw as many was, uh, you know, in the end days of, of Enron and, and uh, Valiant, but now there are far more here. I mean, as you guys probably all know, if you follow the news, there were two more announced last night. The number one and number two guys in supply chain are gone. You know, obviously earlier this month, the, the chief accounting officer who lasted a month was gone. The head of human resources, who was only there, I think a year, was gone. I mean, the departures are through the roof. There's a great guy on, on Twitter, uh, Paul Hoytner, I think his name is, who keeps a, an online Google spreadsheet where he keeps this thing updated. It's my, I mean, these people are leaving millions of dollars each on the table, some of them, in stock options or unvested stock rents or whatever. I mean, they are just fleeing. And, and you know, so there's another point here, which is, you know, there's a guy who's been very vocal on Twitter, this lawyer, uh, uh, in New York, um, uh, Stuart Meisner, who's had a couple of whistleblowers and they've been written about and they've come forward, a uh, business insider, Lynette Lopez is a great reporter. She wrote about them. And, but, you know, the vast majority of whistleblowers are anonymous and want to stay that way. So you have to ask yourself, if, th if this guy Meisner has two very vocal public whistleblowers, there have to be 10 times that many whistleblowers who are working quietly with the SEC and DOJ who don't want to come public. And, you know, again, when you see this many departures, you have to know that there are a vast number of whistleblowers. So, I mean, the DOJ could be building a massive case against this company and the SEC. And I, I actually, I suspect that they are. That goes far beyond, you know, Musk's 420 tweet, which of course in and it of itself is pretty major security for it. And by the way, speaking about raising money, that that's an instant, billion dollar plus liability to this company based on the losses, not so much from, from shorts, but from people who got long on that tweet 
until whatever, 17 days later or whatever it was when the company came out and said, oh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's bullshit. You know, Elon made that up, right? So, and, and by the way, this goes right to the board who may not have enough D&O insurance. If you follow the story that, you know, we've talked about that. So, you know, you know, I mean, you know, it's one thing to look for, to, to invest in a company that maybe you're going to patch the balance sheet, but just here's another billion dollar liability on top of that before you get to the necessary CapEx to, to build these other models that are going to grow. And, and again, if you're following the story, the Model 3 backlog for North America is now gone. Even the all-wheel drive backlog is gone. Guys, I just threw something up there that somebody sent me. Guy wanted an all-wheel drive car. In three days, he got the car. I mean, they, there's inventory all over the place. Now, obviously, if they can get this thing homologated for Europe, if they can get through the, the safety issues of the touchscreen, which is a question, you know, then they can fill some European backlog for a quarter. And then that's it, because whatever the reservation number is, and I doubt it's the one that they've been claiming it is. I think there's stuff going on there too, although I have no proof. Whatever it is, it's for a $35,000 car with a $7,500 tax credit. Well, that tax credit is, is cut in half in January, and then of course continues to be cut down. And there's no way in hell they can build this car for 35,000. I do think they will come out next year with a, with a lower price version. However, I think in the best possible case, it's it's forty thousand dollars, you know, without the premium package. So you know, and and if it's forty thousand dollars without the premium package, and and the and the tax credit at that point is is cut to eighteen hundred dollars, right? You're basically almost at the same price as you are today for the fifty thousand dollar long range version, right? With a premium package and a seventy five hundred dollar tax credit. My point is that if they're out of backlog for the rear wheel drive, $50,000 car, okay, where you get a $7,500 tax credit, so it costs you $42,500, you following me? Then, then the basic car for $40,000 is not very much cheaper than the car that they're out of backlog on, to, on a net basis to the buyer, if you follow me. So I think if, if they come out with the shorter range version and it costs 40, which I think it will have to, people will be shocked at how small the demand is because the tax credit will be almost gone by then. And, and so if you're not paying 50 for the car today because you're waiting for the cheaper car, the net cost is going to be the same. You follow that? You see what I'm saying there? So people aren't looking at that. People think, oh, now, if they came out with it for 35, yeah, you know, that's, that would be significant and, and there'd be demand. I don't think they can do it. I, I'm looking at 40. And have you tried to investigate like what, who is pumping the stock up? Like, is it institutional? <laughs> is it, I like, wish I knew. The, 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 the number one question I hear from people, you know, with, as I said, guys who have been around forever, who you've heard of is, Mark, who the hell is buying this thing? I don't know. Now, there's been some analysis done where, you know, the actual float is pretty small and there's a lot of computers and day traders flipping it back and forth. And that's, that's probably a lot of it. I mean, it, 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 it could move on this relatively small float, but beyond that, I don't know. I mean, you know, listen, maybe somebody's doing something offshore, you know, maybe we'll, this will all come out in the DOJ investigation. Nothing would surprise me. I mean, we did find someone sent me and I put it out there, a Curacao, um, trust account called the Musk Trust or whatever, which in the in the Musk in the document filing it had the right to buy puts and calls of the American stock market. Now, is that even Elon Musk? I don't know. You know, maybe it's maybe it's his retarded younger brother, but uh, the guy with the cowboy hat. But even that guy probably would do whatever Elon told him. But you know, maybe it's his father or his mother. I don't know. We don't know that that's Elon, but you know, people are looking into that too. So anyway. Yeah, that that, uh, that trust was actually uh, opened, I guess, um, the day before Model 3 reservation um, it, opened. It was opened, I'm not sure if it was the day before or a couple of days after, but it was opened the same week. And, you know, the same time that, that Musk was tweeting every few hours, the reservation count is this, it's that. Hurry up and get one or you won't get a car. Well, you know, I mean, and now, by the way, the last official update 
we had on the model for your reservation was at the end of Q2. And, and do you guys remember what he claimed that number was? He claimed it was 420,000. <laughs> do you believe that? <laughs> 420 again? I will fucking bet you any amount of money that they had to put something in the press release and, and someone said, hey, Elon, what do you want to say? And he thought for a second, you know, maybe he took another drag on his, on his joint and said, Let, let's say it's 420,000. <laughs> I'll bet you that's what happened. <laughs> and Mark, what do you think is the biggest threat to your thesis? Like what, what do you consider, like where do you see, you know, if you put the other side front, like where well, do you I mean, see The biggest threat is, is stupid money, you know, with, not necessarily to buy the company, but you know, to put enough money in to give it some chance of surviving, you know, at the current market cap, which I get, again, I mean, nothing's impossible. I think that's incredibly unlikely, you know, but I can't say it's impossible. But other than that, any threat to my thesis is at a much, much, much lower equity price where there's an increasing chance that stupid money would come in and do something. I mean, still very stupid, but not as stupid as putting money in it at a $60 billion valuation. But of course, you know, the risk there is, you know, it's look, it's possible that, that somebody comes in and puts, you know, $5 billion into this company at a, at a $20 billion uh, equity valuation and the stock goes up to 80 billion on it, right? I mean, it's not impossible. It's a relatively limited float. And, you know, people could say, oh, it's safe now. And then we get into that territory of, you know, no price is too high to pay. And, you know, 290 is the same as 390 is the same as 490 is the same as 590. That's a risk. It's, it's a risk that somebody comes in here and, 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 you know, puts money into this stock at, you know, I don't know, uh, $50 a share and the stock goes to to 450. It's not impossible in this market. Now, the one thing that I have working in my favor, and, and anybody who's short anything has working in his favor, is interest rates are going up worldwide and liquidity is coming off the table. I mean, literally next week, or, or I guess in 10 days, you know, the US Fed balance sheet roll off goes from 40 billion a month to 50 billion a month, and the ECB monthly printing goes from 30 billion euros to 15 billion euros. And in three months, the ECB stops printing and the Fed continues to roll off 50 billion a month off its balance sheet. So the, the, the stupid money is sort of drying up. On the other side of the coin in Europe, you know, real interest rates are still very negative. Here in the US, you know, short term real interest rates are only at essentially at zero. They don't get positive, you know, until the Fed increase next week. And even then it's you know, a toss up, depending on what you use for an inflation metric, whether they're positive. So, I mean, money is still really cheap, but at least the printing other than Japan is, you know, is on the way out. And, and, and on a net basis, it's, it's negative now, if you just, you know, net, net Europe against the US and it becomes a lot more negative in January. Uh, one of our other students, uh, Luis, uh, had, um, had an interesting point. Uh, Luis, uh, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Adrian, so uh, quick background, uh, Excel side research uh, for five years have been in private equity the past two years. Um, I guess- I can't see the video by the way, Luis, it's on, but it's, um, but it's black. I don't know if you have uh, saw, uh, something over your camera. Oh yeah, it's perfect. There we go. Yep. Um, Mark, if someone was interested in investing, you know, they're bullish on the electric car theme, what other public market options do they have besides Tesla? Because one theory I had is there's a lot of people who are excited about the direction of electric cars. They want to be able to play it. There hasn't been any other option other than Tesla, or at least that's the highest profile. So is there, is there anything else that you would, I know Neo just went public. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Neo's valuation is much more of a value of, of a joke than, than even Tesla is, you know? Um, and, and look, I mean, you know, electric cars are going to be dominated by the same OEMs that dominate regular cars, right? I mean, you know, Daimler is going to build <clears throat> fantastic electric cars. Audi will build fantastic electric cars. But so, 
you have to you have to sort of bifurcate your your question into into two, which is, um, you know, what's going to be the effect on the company versus the sexiness of the stock, right? I mean, basically, these companies are going to be exchanging, you know, internal combustion engine sales for electric sales, right? So overall, you know, if you like Daimler right now at you know wherever it is, you know, five or six times EBITDA. You know, by the way, which is intriguing to me, except for where we are in the cycle, I'm a little afraid that it's that we're late in the cycle. Then you know, then if you say, well, you know, if Daimler gets the the um, the the Musla uh, the Musla <laughs> the Tesla Musla is a good word the Musk and Tesla sort of sex appeal for making electric cars, then you know maybe maybe Daimler can can double even on the same revenue and profitability because it's making more electric cars. I don't know. But if you're asking me from a fundamental standpoint, I don't know what good pure plays there are. I mean, batteries are basically a commodity, right? So you could buy a battery company, but, you know, the margins are, are not particularly good there. But I guess I would look at, you know, you could look at LG or Samsung or whatever. I haven't really. Um, you know, there are probably some small public suppliers that make, you know, key parts for electric motors and stuff. But the ones that I've heard about, I've looked at, and their valuations kind of are off the charts already. I don't remember the names. There was one written up in Barron's not too long ago. But I haven't seen anything else that's like sort of an undiscovered gem in electric cars now, you know, but that's not to say it isn't out there. Yeah, let me make a, a point about this, uh, Mark. You might be interested in this about, uh, you know, one of the things I haven't heard you talk about of the dozens of catalysts uh, for Tesla working is, is, is uh, Luis pointing out that there will be other ways to play it in the market. Um, I re remember um, um, I ran in, I was short iRobot, and I <laughs> ran into Andrew Left at, um, at the CES conference in Vegas in uh, January, probably 2015 or so. And I'm just pulling up the stock chart on iRobot to show you what happened here. Um, you know, the stock was in the $30 range or so. Um, and, uh, um, and Andrew said, no, don't short that because it's the only, um, it's the kind of stock, you know, they make, you know, they make the Roomba, right? But they um, they make robots, and robots are sort of cool and sexy. So yeah. it's the kind of thing you can get pumped on the message boards, and they've got a they've got a cool ticker IRBT. But most <laughs> importantly, it's the only way to play this theme, right? There's only one stock, one company. Uh, so any if the if the retail investors out there or stock promoters are looking for something to promote. You know, this is something where there's just one stock. And so everyone on earth who is excited about robots is all going to go into uh, this stock. And sure enough, stock didn't do much for a while, uh, but you can just see it ripped up. It tripled up over 100. Andrew left. Interestingly, at that point, came out with a, a, a bear case on it. Stock dropped back to 60, but now basically it's at an all-time high, uh, trading at 53 times earnings, 24 times times EBITDA, um, uh, and it's just not that good a business. Um, but uh, um, so that was a real cautionary tale, but it does tell me, okay, I think a lot of the same dynamics here are at work in Tesla. So, um, so they are, uh, it, that's a fantastic point. I mean, it's, a, it's, it, it's really, it's a great point. And I considered that on Tesla uh, the whole way up, but my argument the whole time, and it was borne out by announcements from, from three and four years ago, is that everyone would be making electric cars. Now, not everyone has, has been making you know, robots to clean your house. I mean, they were a pure play on robots, but they were also the only guy, as far as I know, making robots to clean your house. Whereas what I've argued for four years, and it's coming true, but it's taken four years, everyone is going to be making electric cars before Tesla's, you know, profit, profitability window is open. So, but to your point, you know, there are sort of Momo, not fundamental, not long-term thinking investors out there. And you're hundred percent right. They jumped on Tesla as the pure play in electric cars, and they didn't care that everyone else would be making electric cars. So, it's not exactly analogous, but it's you're making a great point. And yeah, maybe that's the hindsight point. 
you know, no, and which is what my girlfriend had said a couple of years ago. Nobody's going to care that everyone else is making electric cars until they see them making electric cars. And maybe that's good advice on, on how not to short a bubble if it's a, if it's a pure play like that. Or people think it's got the impression of being a pure play. It's a great point, Whitney. Great point. Yeah. Um, to a um, um, couple of thoughts I want to wrap on and then we'll let you go. Um, number one is, is you know, you're, you're a, a fascinating case study on, um, uh, in a number of dimensions. And, you know, when I have our students sort of read your investor letters and see how aggressively you've sized this and all, um, you know, some folks are like, you know, this is, you know, this is just way too aggressive and so forth. And I, um, and I point out to them though, that look, when you're a small manager, when you're, when you're, you know, sub $10 million, uh, let's say, um, it, you don't really have a viable business. Like you have to, you have to grow assets up to at least a few tens of millions, I would say, before you got a viable business. And the problem is, is there are thousands and thousands of small guys out there, uh, almost all men. Uh, that's why I use the term guys. Uh, but uh, uh, you got to do something to uh, uh, have a shot. You got to put up some big numbers, at least for a two, number one, like Samadrangi did with the China. Uh, uh, bubble, uh, you know, the China frauds back in 2010, 11, I think it was, put up a couple big years and he grew from 300,000 under management to 500 million. So in other words, um, you know, uh, my advice would be different for someone who's got a hundred million dollar fund or bigger, right? Um, you know, if you're Bill Ackman, putting 10% of your fund going on a jihad, uh, on Herbalife uh, is probably too aggressive and he takes big bets, right? But when you're small, you, you got to look for an opportunity to take some risk, uh, to take a much bigger position than you otherwise might, to, to do two things. Number one, put up a big year or two um, that might attract some attention and grow your business. Um, but also what you've done, um, you know, for you must be the most well-known $8 million under management fund on earth. Um, um, and so, you know, you picked an area, um, you've, uh, and you're out there, you've become the world expert on a particular topic, you know, the same thing I did with the housing bubble or with lumber liquidators. Um, and so this is, this is, it's, it's risky, it's aggressive, but you know, when you're small, you got to look for a couple opportunities to really take some risk. Um, in exchange for building a name for yourself. Like if Tesla goes down a lot, that's a career maker for you, right? Uh, so I don't know if you have any comments on yeah, that. But I you do. Know, here. So, so just to be clear, none of that uh, has, uh, you know, none of that has, has anything to do with why I put this position on and size it the way I have. And everything you said makes sense. But just to be clear, I'm, my personal money is roughly 40% of my fund, okay? I have a fairly small nut for a guy living in a nice apartment in Manhattan that, that we share. And so, um, and, and I have historically, you know, since, and, and I, you know, until the last 18 months, um, but going back and I have um, uh, audited returns from, from 2005, so I can actually, because I had my, my PA from those years I was an investment banker had that audited to market my fund. So I've historically compounded in, until very recently on this Tesla thing at roughly 20% a year gross since, uh, since 2005, or I had until the last 18 months. So what I'm saying is on, on, my, on my personal, call it my nut, which is about roughly 3 million in the fund and then another million that I invest outside of the fund, you know, I can make a very good living that way. And, and I am so much of the fun that when I put this big position on, I've just sort of done what I've always done, which is taken big positions. And I've really put, I have never thought, okay, I'm going to roll the dice here and I'm either going to get huge or I'm going to go bust, but it's the only shot I have. No, I run this fund as if it were all my own money because, you know, it is a lot of my own money. So that that's not to say what you're saying is wrong. But, um, you know, I would do this if I had no fund at all. And it was, and it was just me. In fact, I'd probably be bigger in the position as crazy as that sounds. So now what you're saying, by the way, what you're saying is true. I mean, 
if I turn out to be right on Tesla and it does collapse, it will definitely benefit the fund and it will work out really well. And it'll, of course, benefit me personally. But that's that hasn't been my thought process here. Not that that's wrong, but that's a dangerous way to think, because if you are wrong, then you blow the whole thing up and you're done. You know, so. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, my uh, I was 15 months into my professional money management career. Um, I started January 1st of 99. And uh, I made Berkshire, so it was the tail end of a 17 year bull market. Uh, I caught the last 15 months of the internet bubble. Um, I made Berkshire Hathaway my largest position at around $65,000 a share uh, the day I launched. Uh, thank goodness I had some residual tech stocks like AOL I've been riding for a couple of years, you know, some Microsoft Intel. So despite sort of, sort of being a value guy, you know, had a good year in 1999, uh, and then 2000 came about and, and the market peaked on March, I think it was March 10th of 2000, it was a Friday. I remember because I was going away on spring break um, and the madness uh, at that point in the 15 months, the NASDAQ had doubled. Um, the entire NASDAQ had doubled um, and um, had till rays all over the place. Uh, you know, I, I, I at et cetera, et cetera. And it was madness, but Berkshire was getting pounded and I was down 35, 40%. Uh, Berkshire went from, you know, 65, I think I bought it as high as 70 in early 90, uh, early 1999. It was down to $41,600 a share. And I remember because I decided to put 30% of my then $4 million fund uh, into Berkshire at the bottom. Um, and it, I happened to do it. Um, uh, the day the NASDAQ peaked was the day Berkshire bottomed. And you just had a flow of funds into tech, into the dot-com boom, out of value. So, you know, that's, uh, it wasn't a coincidence, <clears throat> obviously, that the day the NASDAQ was the day Berkshire bottomed. And, you know, today I probably wouldn't put 30% of, uh, you know, if I had a decent sized fund, I wouldn't put 30% in any one stock. But if you're going to do it, you know, obviously better do it on the long side than the short side, less risky. And better to do it with a company like Berkshire, with a CEO like Buffett, trading at, at, at cash and investments, you know, where you're paying nothing for the operating businesses. But, you know, the, the guys, um, you know, looking for an opportunity to develop incredible expertise, in-depth knowledge, a contrarian viewpoint, and then bet it super big um, financially but then also shout it from the rooftops and put together a big PowerPoint presentation and go public with it um, and make an awful lot of noise um, is, uh, is, uh, is a not unreasonable strategy to uh, try and break out of the dinky fun trap, I would call it. So, so a, a couple of things. First of all, just as, as human nature, normally, but not for everybody, the wealthier you get, the less you tend to risk on any one position because you have that much more to lose, right? So, you know, if I were worth a billion dollars, you know, maybe Tesla would be a, 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 a 5% or 10, maybe it'd be a 10% position for me, but it wouldn't be a 25 or 30% position, but I'm small enough where, you know, I just, I just put on bigger positions. It's just, I think part of that is, is human nature, at least it is for me. But the other thing is, honestly, I have not, I have not, seeked any of the sort of coverage or publicity I've gotten here. I really haven't. It's just, this thing has been so outrageous to me and I just naturally have a big mouth and, and I guess a, a big keyboard that I've just been spouting off on it and, and people have found me, you know, I mean, I've, you know, I've, in, until I pissed off CNBC, they had me on a few times talking about this and, you know, now it's, now I'm down to, you know, Cheddar and, and Yahoo TV. <laughs> But at any rate, these guys just call me up. And, you know, CNN recently, and they call me up and say, hey, you want to come on? And I'm like, okay, sure, man. I'm not going to turn it down because I do realize that once this thing is over, nobody's going to give, you know, two flying fox what I have to say. And, and I'll never be on TV again. So what the hell? Yeah, but I'm but keep, in mind, keep in mind, Mark, um, they will remember you like Jim Chanos is known as the guy on Enron. I'm known as the guy on Lumber Liquidators. You know, if this if this works, and that's still an okay. if, well, right? That, you know, that, know, that's that's, that's a bonus. Be the yeah, no, that that would be a nice yeah. bonus. I mean, I can, but really, when I went down to CNBC, I just thought it would be cool to see the set and see the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. I figure 
I, I never thought, okay, I'm going to promote myself. I just thought, oh, it'd be cool to see this stuff because I'll probably never have a chance to do it again. And, and so that's been my outlook on this whole thing. I mean, this stuff is fun and it's great, but it's not something I looked for. People just found me on this. The same way you, I mean, you found me, right? And I think you, I think you might be the guy who introduced me to David Einhorn, who put me in Robin Hood. It, it's been a lot of fun. I mean, other than losing the money, it's, <laughs> I've met great people like you and it's, and it's been a lot of fun, but I have never, I've never consciously thought about this as, as a marketing instrument. I really haven't. It, it will turn out to be funny because, because I'm, I'm teaching you as a marketing, as a, as a good example of, <laughs> yeah. of a guy in marketing. You're saying, you know, look, I'm also teaching you. You're, you're, you're both a, 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 an exemplar in that how does a completely obscure guy who's not even really trying is developing a, a name and you're using social media very effectively. You're, uh, you're taking opportunities to speak at high profile conferences like Iris Stone and mine. Um, uh, uh, um, so you're an exemplar in that sense. On the other hand, uh, you're getting hammered uh, financially. Um, and you know, the, the Tesla can stay, uh, can, can stay elevated longer than you can stay solvent, you know, to paraphrase, uh, to, to mangle that old saying, right? Like there's, there's there's a cautionary tale here right right so it's absolutely a, you're a beautiful case study even, even if you're not trying to be yeah um, uh, you have your hand up a question yes um mark wanted to understand from technical point of view like from for uh, to attract the new limited partners if they'll be coming in your fund they'll be locking in the losses right or how does it work no no it's um it's your mark to um your personal um, you, you know, your, your personal high watermark or personal performance from the day somebody comes into the fund. Nobody's, nobody's locked into anything. That's so for that's, example, like your borrowing costs over the years, prior years, they will not be part of the, no, it's whatever, whatever the NAV, the net asset value of the fund is today. That's where somebody comes in. So the overall fund, you know, we set our high watermark, uh, at the very end of 2016. So we're down over the last 20 months or whatever from that. But if somebody comes in today, they're coming in at that lower level and then whatever gains they have from here or the fund has from here are their gains above their person. Now, other people who are below the high water mark, I'm not gonna collect you know, 20% uh, management or 20% um, carry you know, incentive fee on that until, the, until they're above their own personal high water marks. You know? Everybody has their own high water mark, is I guess what I'm saying. So, yeah. for example, what would yeah. be the difference between putting a short personally or investing in your fund? If we, let's say Tesla is your biggest position right now. Well, t Tesla's my biggest position, but it's still even now with, with everything, it's, it's probably a third of the fund, you know, roughly. Um, so, two thirds of the fund is other stuff. But no, the difference is with me, you know, you're going to pay a 20% incentive fee on the profits above whatever the net asset value of when you come into the fund is, you know, our management fee is, is tiny. It's 50 basis points. And actually I've waived it for everybody in the fund until the whole fund uh, gets above its high watermark. So, and then beyond that, we have expenses, which are basically the audit and the administration. And, you know, that runs at around roughly 30 or 35 basis points a year. So, you know, if you and only, the borrowing costs should be huge, big as well, no? Since you're short. No, on Tesla, there's actually a positive rebate, or there was the last time I looked because. Really? Yeah, the borrow. Yeah, I, if you hang on one second, just give me a second. I'll I'll tell you I'll tell you right now what it is. Hang on one second. By the way, we use I use interactive brokers uh, for our prime broker, which has been fantastic. I I highly recommend them. Um, there's a net rebate right now of 31 basis points on Tesla. So, because the fee rate, the borrow rate is is 160 basis points, and but you know the money is earning whatever I guess 190 basis points in in, in a short term wherever they park the cash. Okay, interesting. Uh, that that surprises me that there's a positive uh, carry yeah. on that because I remember there were times when it was tough to get the borrow. Well, it, it, by the way, even at times when it's been tough to get the borrow lately, the borrow rate for whatever reason has been really low on Tesla. The time the borrow rate really spiked was going into the Solar City merger vote in 2016, when people had a call in their stock in order to be able to vote in, in, in that proxy filing. And then borrow got really tight and the rate spiked up to like 35% a year for a while, you know? But then again, that's nothing like Tilray. When I looked the other day, 
the Tilray borrow rate was 370% a year or something like that. I've never seen any, I don't know yeah, if anybody- Glenn saw, Glenn saw somewhere 600%. <laughs> Here, hang on one second. Just, just, what the hell? I'll take a quick look now because I'm actually, I'm actually curious if there's. And there, by the way, yeah. What? So, <laughs> so according to IB, there's no borrow available, but the last indicative rate was 509 percent a year. <laughs> by the way, well, stocks down 17 percent on the open today. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, I have I have a very good feeling that uh, my appearance on Yahoo Finance uh, video a couple a uh, couple days ago, where I said uh, I said I've never been more sure of anything in my life that this thing is gonna is gonna be way down pr uh, by ninety percent within twelve months. It may get there a lot sooner. Um, it could be down ninety percent within twelve minutes. <laughs> It's been it's been a very interesting three days to be teaching a seminar on short selling. Uh, so with that, Mark, uh, I want to really thank you uh, for joining us. I hope you enjoyed this video. Again, if you'd like to learn more about case learning and our programs, just go to caselearning.com. And if you have any questions, email me at info at caselearning.com. Thank you.